right. Without further ado, please welcome Bob Haas. It says point microphone at your mouth in big <laughs> letters. It's one of my subjects, we'll see. So good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be here for the 30th anniversary. Everything we do this week and next is going to partly honor the staff and honor Wyatt Prunty. It's one thing to get an idea. It's another thing to carry it out for 30 years. When I was an undergraduate, I think there were two creative writing MFA programs in the country. I was unaware of either of them. <laughs> and one summer program, I think. Uh, so this place has nourished now three generations of writers. It's pretty thrilling. And, and Wyatt did it. And we really thank you. Where are you, Wyatt? There, there. Um, <laughs> I had the idea that what I would do is talk you through a few poems that are on my mind today. The subject of, that's on my mind through these poems is moral numbness, which I'll, which I'll come to. Um, so it's going to be more a lecture on the art than on the craft of poetry. Um, so, but, so I wanted to begin by giving you the best one-sentence craft lecture I ever heard um, by the Irish short story writer Frank O'Connor, who said to me in 1967, there is only one rule of writing, and that is that you can't revise nothing. <laughs> That's my craft talk. <laughs> but I heard a wonderful craft talk not long ago by the um, poet Jane Miller, and I thought I could pass that on in a minute or two, too. She gave a talk on the question in poetry, how, how it's there and how it functions, and began by saying maybe you could think of 20th century poetry being initiated by a question, the opening line of Do We Know Elegies by Rilke, which goes, who, if I cried out, would hear me? among the angelic orders, or however you translate, or dongan, um, and goes on to say accurately, I think, that the, the, that whole set of suite of 10 poems is really an answer to that question, which led her to observe tons of poems begin with the question, Western wind, when wilt thou blow? Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? that to be or not to be, that is the question. It's very, really interesting to suddenly look at one's poems and say, what question is it asking and, and what question does it answer? She also said that many of the poems she loves most end with questions. And the three examples she gave were from Yeats. Um, first was um, Great Rooted Blossomer, Oh, brightening glance, how can you tell the dancer from the dance? And the other was being so caught up, so mastered by the brute blood of the air, did she put on his knowledge with his power before the indifferent beak had let her drop? Um, and the third now has escaped me. All, all three of them uh, do the same thing, it seemed to me, which is they jump into a question which is a place of, of paradox, of energies going in several different directions as a, as a gesture at the end of a poem. So that's my second craft talk. <laughs> and now on to my subject. So moral numbness, it's on us all the time. And of course, it works by repetition, you know. Um, it was a, it, it's now the case that the New York Times runs an article on the first school shooting every year, sometime in September or October. And as soon as we have that kind of language, it's a sign we're already pretty numb. Uh, one of the pervasive forms of numbness in the culture we live in now 
is treating people who are morally outraged by what's going on as if they're being hysterical. And that's it, why it mentioned Fox News, second mentioned Fox News. That's exactly all they do all day long, is act if, if people whose moral values are affronted by what's happening in this society and the world are, are, are hysterical. So I've been looking at, found myself looking at poems to try to think about uh, how we stay alive morally. And I wanted to start with a poem by a Korean poet named Kim Hae-soon. You have that in your handout. Uh, Kim Hae-soon is, um, is uh, about, she must be about 60 years old. F three or four of her books have been translated by a very wonderful Korean-American poet, Domi Choi, who lives in Seattle. Um, Kim Hae Sun is a professor of, of Korean literature and women's studies. And this poem is called Black Brazier. And it goes, on a very boring day, like a waterfall with its lips buried in its chest, I wanted to taste my own breasts those eyes that stay open inside the black eye patches. My breast might taste like the lighthouse on an island far away from the mainland, or the island's prison, the taste of solitary confinement, or the underground catacomb, like an exploding waterfall tied up tight, tight, like the wavering sea, its wrapping paper ripped open, as if body is generating my eyes, like two baby waterfowl looking for feed on the hills by the sea. I once saw a photograph of hundreds of mothers in a square waiting for their son's corpses. I wanted to undo all the hooks on the backs of the mothers. The eyes on the breasts sobbed, sobbed, their crying echoed through the square. Please don't leave me behind, I'm your mommy. The sound of the swollen eyes inside their eye patches hitting the prison wall. Bam, bam, the eye patches look like somebody's hands. The hands wearing black gloves clutch two chicks in their hands. The fish caught in the net should repent. Have you ever heard of such a thing? The lost chick should repent. Have you ever heard of such a thing? My black bra straps are stretched out like two streams of tears. Now I want to row to someplace deep, like someone rowing in the middle of the sea, wearing an eye patch. Um, there, are a, there are a bunch of things to say about the way this poem works and the gift of freedom that it gives. Its fierceness, its imaginative freedom, This is the part I actually wrote down, and now I can't. Uh, it, the fact that it, uh, imaginative freedom, which is to say it doesn't have an agenda. You can feel it going where her imagination goes. She's a bird nesting its beak and its breast feathers at the outset. She is imagining, is it from kind of spiritual loneliness? that the taste of this self-nursing that she associates with the taste of a lighthouse? In what way are the women's breasts eyes or chicks and black-gloved hands? How do we arrive at mourning mothers in a town square? How does the bra become the eye patches? And how does the speaker in the poem become, at the end, a breast that is a pirate rowing a boat away from the sea in the prison of the expectations her subject has conjured? One way into this poem is something that she said in an interview. She said, we carve on our bodies what society teaches us and continue this task, not knowing the identity they force us to have. This identity is carved on our faces and on our skins. Not knowing our bodies have become a newspaper made of human meat. We stuff our bodies and make them a theater where cultural symbols or suppressed symbols play. It is not possible to explain women's poetry until you sympathize with how women painfully go through the experience of having these tattoos carved on their bodies. From an essay written 10 years ago, it's available on the internet. Um, 
it's interesting. My experience of talking to students about this poem has been interesting because with, I had a group of about uh, 40 of them in the class, 20 men, 22 women in the class. And uh, uh, I explained some formal things about her situation and the history of Korean poetry and how this relates to the Sejo tradition, which is the women's tradition in, in Korean poetry. And they listened to that politely, but they didn't really get interested in it. We started talking about cultural symbols and suppressed symbols. And uh, the, out of the conversation, uh, when I asked them for the main symbolic associations between breasts and black brassiers, what emerged was a tentative list of categories. The categories were one, erotic experience, two, fashion, three, nursing, four, women's health issues, and five, compassion, as in the idea of the milk of loving kindness. I can report that 19 of the 20 males reported that their first association was erotic. <laughs> and the one who, who didn't find that to be his first association had a mother with breast cancer and was gay. Um, the women's responses were about equally divided between fashion, nursing, and health issues. Um, and they wanted to talk about I thought they perhaps acquired a feminist critique of advertising in their growing up, the connection between fashion, advertising, and ideas of the erotic. Some of them wanted to talk about the Madonna tradition in Western art, the idealization of the word nursing mother and the male child who is a divinity and what expectations that places on young mothers. One young male in the middle of this discussion interrupted to say, yeah, but it's got to feel sexy to have breasts, right? <laughs> uh, uh, to which the women gave various responses, which I think <laughs> were educational to the young men in the class. None of that quite gets at what's amazing and strange about this poem. I, Kim Hai Sun is, uh, I think, one of the great poets writing, alive now and writing, and books are profoundly unnerving as you read them. And the way people have found to talk about them, the way she has found to talk about them, has been partly through the subject of the grotesque. Um, to, to get at that, I found myself looking at a wonderful book by the poet Susan Stewart called On Longing, which has a number of chapters on bodily distortion and desire in the shape of poetry. And there is a chapter called The Grotesque Body. She observes that the word grotesque comes from the Italian word for grotto uh, and came to be associated with the kinds of drawings and art that Italians in the Renaissance were finding in the Roman ruins they were excavating passed into French from grotesque to grotesque um, and, and became uh, a word for particular kinds of uh, distortion of body and body parts in art. Um, Susan Stewart then goes to Mikhail Bakhtin's essay on Rabelais in which he talks about uh, carnival grotesquerie the carnival grotesque phrase, I don't know what the Russian is, that, that he uses to, to observe that um, exaggeration of those organs through which the soul communicates with the external world are exaggerated in the art of the grotesque. That is mouth, genitals, anus, and face, surprisingly. <laughs> the visual part because we're creatures who um, first survival mechanism is being able to read the faces of other people. Um, that the distortion of the face is another important and powerful aspect of the grotesque. Tim, are you here? It made me think of your talk last night and the amazing story about the costumes and imagination of those kids. That's a remarkable reading huh? last night. And right at the center of it, I thought, was 
trying to put um, the fact of mortality, the consciousness of mortality, and some idea like uh, the phrase that occurred to me was the name of a German flower, Brennan de Liebe, to put burning love right at the center of this, the ordinary comedy of domestic and family life. It was an amazing thing, and, and the costume was right at the center of it, and I thought it raised the same set of questions that I've been trying to think about, which is how you put love at the center of what's comic and appalling in the world. And the interesting thing about this um, wandering into the grotesque, which she does here, is that it not trying to, it's not trying to do that exactly, or the place in which it's trying to do it is only in that one stanza. I once saw a photograph of hundreds of mothers in a square. The other stuff, how do you think of that your breast might taste like a lighthouse? That just belongs to this woman's extraordinary imagination. You see, her poems happens over and over again. Um, but there is that at the center. The eyes of the breast sob, sob their crying echo through the square. Please don't leave me behind, I'm your mommy might not touch that because it's such sentimental material to even go there. But the aim of the poem is, at one hand, to put that, those, that set of feelings right at the center of the reader's experience of the poem. And then, and then the writer herself can't stay there. She's stuck. This poem is not comforting as her poems, like Sylvia Plath's poems, who she's admired and written about, um, tend not to be. All they do is wake you up by scaring you <laughs> into a whole other set of associations through the idea of the, of the grotto, of the cave, of the hidden place where our metaphorical imaginations are working all the time. And that so became to me one sign of, I don't know how to say to myself how to do that in my work. I don't know how to tell you how to do it in your work. but I, but finding the way to what, what she calls it here is uh, a, a waterfall, a wavering sea, but then an underground catacomb, the underground catacomb where our associations are constantly um, seeing the world in its true and monstrous form. So the, the kids in, in Timmy and Tad in um, Tim's story were taking off their masks by putting on masks. That's one of the things that poetry does, that the arts do. They take off masks by putting on masks and freeing up that whole set of associations that makes us alive and aware. And that, that becomes that church. So I went from there to a poem, remarkable poem, I think, that tries to do that by um, Rosarita, great Chilean to me, great Chilean poet. Rosarita um, is, uh, I think he's about 70 years old. He was uh, an engineering student, a mathematics and engineering student at the University in Valparaiso at the moment when the Chilean military in uh, coordination with the American CIA, um, staged a coup and got rid of the um, democratically elected president of the, of the Republic of Chile, Salvador Allende, um, who died in the course of the coup. Um, and uh, Pinochet instituted a four-year, ended up really being from 1973 to 1990, but four-year reign of terror in which he essentially arrested and tortured all the leaders of labor unions and teachers unions in the country, 30,000 of them, Truth and Reconciliation found, Foundation found after 30,000 were uh, imprisoned and tortured, 2,800 of those were disappeared. Um, the rumor was, and terror works on rumors, terror was that the bodies were dropped on mountaintops in the sea and in the deserts with their eyes gouged out. 
the, the, the reports found that it was only true of three or 400 of them. It wasn't all 2,800 who had their eyes gouged out. But it was useful to instill caution in a, in a, uh, in a society by letting those rumors of terror spread, a classic tactic of Tsardom. And, um, and during those years, uh, Zarita, who be moved from engineering to philosophy, was in prison briefly and tortured. He's now suffering from Parkinson's disease, but still alive and still writing. His family background is Italian. His grandparents are from Spleto. So he's very interested in Ezra Pound. Um, and he's also interested in lifelong interest in Dante and spent many of those years of the Chilean Pinochet regime. By the way, there's a great movie uh, by the journalist Elizabeth Farnsworth called The General and the Judge about the very conservative judge in Chile who forced to investigate these things, not believing they were true, sure they were liberal hysteria, uh, uncovered exactly what had happened in those years. It's called, it's, it's, I think you can see it on, on video, uh, and, it's, and it's worth seeing, not least because it was our government that partly responsible for what happened. He, he was very interested in Dante all his life. His first book was called Purgatorio, his second, Ante Paradiso. And uh, he never was able to write a Paradiso. And he wrote instead in 19, 2000, about the year 2004, a poem called INRI, standing for Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, the INRI on the back of Episcopal and Catholic uh, church vestments. And it's a poem that tries, well, let's just turn to it. Um, The, it, it's, it's written in sections. The intellectual model for it is Dante. The formal model is Rambo's Illuminations, that set of prose poems from the end of his life. And it begins with an epigraph from Luke. And I say to you, if they keep silent, the stones will cry out. And this first part is called The Sea. And I, the, the, William Cole, the translator of this poem, is British. And in British English, baits is a plural. American English, you don't sell baits, you sell bait, right? So this, when I was put off from this poem for a while because I couldn't stand the first line. Right? <laughs> um, it just didn't sound right, so we have to do an American translation and say, strange bait rain from the rains from the sky. Surprising bait falls upon the sea. Down below the ocean, up above unusual clouds on a clear day, surprising bait rains on the sea. There was a love raining. There was a clear day that's raining now on the sea. I'm partly interested in that word, love. It's a big risk. I, I think it's one I would ever have the guts to take for the reason that it could go wrong. You have to read the poem yourself to decide whether it does. But in a way, it's the whole point here. And the, and the reason I thought something about the gesture this poem makes rhymes with what Tim was doing last night and rhymes with the question of how you it, it, formally, it's an ode question, insofar as the ode is a litany poem that tries to, is near to prayer and tries you get into right relation to values that matter to you, to discover them if you can't find them. The black brazier can't find them, doesn't try to find them. It knows they're located somewhere near those women just crying in the square. They are shadows, bait for fishes. Clear day is raining, a love that was never said. Love, ah, yes, 
love, amazing bait is raining from the sky on the shadows of fishes in the sea. Clear days fall, some strange bait with clear days stuck to them, with loves that were never said. The sea, it says the sea, it says bait that rains and clear days stuck to them. It says unfinished loves, clear and unfinished days that rain for the fish in the sea. The structure is litany, as is so much of Spanish language surrealist poetry. I'm sure it comes out of the Catholic prayer tradition. People had it in their heads. You can hear and notice we shift to a you, second person, now engaged in. You can hear whole days sinking, strange sunny mornings, unfinished loves, goodbyes cut short that sink into the sea. You can hear surprising bait that rains from sunny days stuck to them, loves cut short, goodbyes that are not anymore, bait, are bait that is told of that rains for the fish in the sea, the brilliant blue sea. You can hear shoals of fish devouring bait stuck with words that are not, days and news that is not, loves that are not anymore. It is told of shoals of fish that leap, of whole whirlwinds of fish that leap. You can hear the sky. I say ode, but there's also elegy, of course, in here in that way. It's an elegy. If you look at the, about the beginning of almost all the classic elegies, oh, wild west wind, thou breath, the first thing they do is try to animate the universe, to have grief animate the universe before you go dead. And then the classic subject of the elegy is, how do you not get killed? How do you not get killed by it, by grief? F Freud's way of talking about this, his great essay, was to make a distinction between mourning and melancholy. And his, his way of talking about depression as a way of saying, you know, the problem of depression is that you feel loyalty of staying dead with the dead, lost with the lost. And you have to find a way back to life that doesn't feel like a betrayal of life. And that process is also going on in us in many ways, a deadness to what's going on, to what we're feeling. And one kind of answer is litany. Pile it on and make it alive with, make it alive with loss. You can hear the sky. It is told that amazing bait rains down with pieces of sky stuck to them upon the sea. And then a move to first person. I heard a sea and a sky hallucinated. I heard suns exploding with love, with love, with love fall like fruits. I heard whirlwinds of fish devouring the pink flesh of surprising bait. I heard millions of fish which are tombs with pieces of sky inside, with hundreds of words that were never said, with hundreds of flowers of red flesh and pieces of sky in the eyes. I heard hundreds of loves that were stopped on a sunny day, bait rain from the sky. Viviana cries. Um, I wrote to William Cole and to Norma Coles, two poets who wrote, wrote about this, and say, who is Viviana? Um, none, of, none of the names in this poem are, they must be the names, assume that they're the names of some of the disappeared, but they're not. There's no, there's no backstory here. Viviana cries. Viviana heard whirlwinds of fishes rise up in the air, fighting for mouthfuls of goodbye cut short of a prayer not heard, of a love not said. Viviana is on the beach. Viviana today is Chile. This is the next big move, and it's the move in the poem to identify the dead with what Chile is, and also the title of the poem and what's coming, to identify them with, to identify them and their suffering with a Christ which is redemptive love. It's, it's an astonishingly Catholic um, effort to make a theology of suffering uh, out of a poem. And whether you think it succeeds or not, um, well, you have to read the whole thing. Um, and it's the place where his critics say, hysterical. The long fish that is Chile 
think of the shape of the country, rises up through the air devouring the bait of sun that are its dead. A little bit more of this because we can't. Tremendous plains rain down for the fishes, days that will now never be, eyes stuck in a final sky, loves that were not said. It says tremendous plains made of arms that couldn't embrace, of hands that didn't touch. It says strange fruits that the fish devour, that the silver tombs, which are the, are the fish devour. Um, there's an interview with the poet Forrest Gander online. Another thing about Rosarita is that he created an anthology of what he thought were the 20 Latin American poems that matter to him the most. It's an anthology called Pinholes in the Night. And it was edited, an English translation was edited by Forrest Gander. So if you want a quick read on the classic, on one classic reading of the history of Latin American poetry, from, from Dario through the present. That, it's a delicious book. Anyway, there was an interview with Forrest Gander, and he asked him about the phrase, strange fruit, and asked him if he had Billie Holiday in mind. And he said, oh, yes. I'll come to that in a minute. It says, strange fruit that the fish devour, that the silver tombs which are the fish devour. I heard extraordinary plains raining on the sea, extraordinary skies, days, dreams sinking into the silver pool, whirlpools of waves. I heard the silver mouths of fish devouring unfinished goodbyes. I heard immense plains of love saying that, that no more angels. The oddness of that, I think, is an attempt to render a sort of not completed sentence in Spanish imitating the not completedness of the lives of the disappeared. I heard immense planes of love saying that, that no more angels, musical scores of love saying no more universes, cosmoses, unfinished winds raining down in thousands of pink baits on the carnivorous sea of Chile. I heard planes of love never said infinite skies of love sinking into the carnivorous tombs of the fish. Here is the sea, it says, the carnivorous tombs of the fish. Here is the almond-colored flesh and the sea. The sea weeps. Viviana weeps. I'm going to skip down to the last stanza on that page. Viviana hears surprising human bait raining down, amazing human fruit harvested in strange fields. Viviana is now Chile. She hears human fruit raining down like golden suns exploding on the water. I'm not going to go th through this to the end, but if you turn the page over to 17 or 16, the first stanza and then the first one's on 17. Amazing harvest rained out of the sky. Incredible ripe fruit upon the plowed fields of the sea. Viviana hears muted silhouettes fall, minutes that did not finish, sacred crosses that rain like clouds upon the waves of the Pacific. She hears torsos, strange mists coming off the waves, strange clouds of soft flesh against the empty sky of the ocean. I'm interested in the introduction of the word sacred there and the idea of sacred crosses because over on the beginning of the next page, those stanzas, crosses made of fish for the Christs. The arch of the Chilean sky falls on the bloody tombs of Christ for the fishes. That's your mother there. That's your son. Shadows fall on the sea. Strange human bait falls on the crosses of fishes in the sea. Viviana wants to cradle fishes in her arms, wants to hear the clear day, that love cut short, that unchanging sky. Viviana is now Chile. She cradles fish under the sky that cries Hazana. Surprising Christ's fall in strange positions onto the crosses of the sea. 
surprising date, rains from the sky, a last prayer rains, a last passion, a last day under the skies of Zanas. Infinite skies fall in strange positions under the sea. Infinite skies fall, infinite skies of broken legs, of arms bent against the neck, of heads twisted against back skies. Weep downward, falling in broken postures, in clouds of broken backs and broken skies. They fall, they sing. That's your mother there, that's your son. That's not the end. It's enough to give you the idea of what this poem's attempting to do, and it's attempting to do it partly by incantation, just by the power of incantation and repetition, and partly by that kind of um, uh, grotesque thinking, thinking from inside the grotto of the associations that put things together and superimpose on those by a left-wing intellectual who's read Dante is the idea that the suffering of the people, of those people between 1979 and 1984, 2,800 people whose bodies were disposed of, they represent what Chile is and what love is in the Christian faith. Uh, it's put here to suffer and to redeem us through its suffering. It's, um, as I read it, that's the proposal of the poem. I included a little more of it from the next section. Uh, if you kind of turn pages past where we just were, there is a section called Flowers, and it's the one that deals with the desert, the bodies that were thrown in the desert. And it takes its epigraph from, from John. Peace be unto you. And you can see that the technique is a pretty much the same. I'll just read to you the um, uh, page 79, those first stanzas in which he turns to this subject. A face is a face in a desert in flower. I hear wide plains flower. I heard the whole deserts cover themselves with flowers. Flowers of face in the solitude of the desert is a face as a flower in the solitude of things. I heard Raul Zarita read in Granada in the courtyard of the Lorca family home uh, with a back up against him a portrait of the young Lorca cast onto a screen 17 miles from the place where he was murdered um, under this beautiful old chestnut tree. Uh, Zaruta, who who's, can hardly make himself stand up straight from his neurological difficulties, read uh, uh, this section of the of the poem about faces with Lorca's face. A flower is a face in the solitude of the desert as a face is a flower in the solitude of things. A face hears years, season, endless lives that finish. A flower just a few days, a few twilights, a few endless nights that finish. A face is another flower that finishes. I heard infinite deserts that had come into flower destroyed. I'm called Sarita. First place he mentions himself in the, in the poem. And I tell you these things just like I could tell you others. Maybe the demented flowers love one another, the Chilean desert. There's a ship in the middle of the desert. Uh, the group of young college leftists that he was arrested with were placed in the hold of a ship in the harbor in Valparaiso. I think that's why the ship comes up. There's a ship in the middle of the desert and a woman leaving flowers beside it. The stones cry out. No one except stones can cry out like that. The flowers also cry out, but only when the wind bends them. I heard whole fields of flowers bending in the wind. They gouged out their eyes. Did you know that? They tore the eyes from the sockets. 
That is why in these poems no one sees, they only hear the flowers here and sometimes cry out when they bend in the wind. The faces do not see, the stones are mad and only cry out. No one sees, maybe the sickled flowers love one another. You get enough to get the taste of it, the idea of this remarkable poem. It's, um, it's not that long, 100 pages, uh, published by the New York Review of Books in this translation by William, William Cole, to have. Um, so to take, the, to take the suffering of a people or the wrongs of a society and name it and try to put it at the middle of, of um, uh, an act of imagination um, is, a, is a partly a stunt of rhetoric and partly one of, of imagination, the combination of finding the formal way to to get there and also the, the metaphors the, the in both poems, the cave thinking, the place where we make our uh, most powerful, helpless associations. Um, in talking about this in the interview with Forrest Gander, one of the things that he says is that you could make the argument that the main causes of slavery in the Western, in the, in the Americas, were um, cotton and sugar. Um, that it was bringing people to grow those crops to make a lot of money that, that um, uh, made the slave trade and made it possible. And so we are every day wearing the history of slavery on our, which is a history of suffering, which is a history of striving for freedom, which is a history, in his terms, he would want to make the argument it's a history of love, um, to where sugar, it's, you stir, you're stirring slavery into your tea and you're stirring, well, it's all, actually it's all made from corn syrup now, but there was a time when it was all sugar. And he talked about the job of poetry being to keep us alive. And what he said about that was this. Without poetry, it's possible that violence would be the norm, the steady state. But because poems exist, all violence is unjustifiable, is monstrous. So you have to believe something like that. So the next poem is by an American poet Robert Duncan, a uh, poem called, a poem beginning with a line from Pindar. It's an ode-like poem. It was written in the late 1950s. It's, um, it, uh, Robert Duncan is associated with, the, with uh, the Black Mountain poets, with the poets of the 50s who tried to revive modernist uh, forms. Um, he, he, what's particular to him is kind of mixing up uh, metaphysical poetry and high romantic bardic poetry with modernist techniques of various kinds. Um, uh, you, you, I think you'll see as we look through it why I wanted to read this poem. So there are four parts of it and the first part is takes the occasion of Goya's painting of Cupid and Psyche to meditate on the story of Cupid and Psyche. And just to remind you, Psyche is, of course, the soul. Eros, or Cupid, is the god love, the most beautiful being ever made, fashioned by his mother, the goddess of love. Um, he fell in love with, love fell in love with the soul, the human soul, and wanted to visit it. But the deal was he would only come visit her at night and he could not see her. It had to be in the dark. And, uh, and uh, all night they made love and whispered to each other and told each other everything in the, in the 
that opening grandeur of intimacy of a of a new love, and uh, her sisters who were jealous of her happiness said, actually, he's a monster. He's a reptile snake, um, which is why you can't see him. And um, made acquisitive of knowledge by this. This is a Neoplatonist story of the fall. The version I'm telling you is the one. Um, it's in Ovid, but it's also in an early novel by Apuleius called The Golden Ass. Um, tells this story. And, and, it's, and it's a kind of pagan story of the fall because the soul goes over to look at love in the face and she lights a candle to do it and she spills hot candle wax onto love's uh, shoulder and she loses him. He's gone. She broke the contract and she's desolated. The soul has been separated from love by acquisitiveness, I guess, cupidity, wanting too much. And um, she is able, after a while, to find a way to the mother of Eros to, and, and plead her case. And she says, I will give you tasks to do in this world. And if you complete all the tasks, you will be reunited. The soul will be reunited to love, is the allegory of the story. Um, Eric Neumann, the psychoanalytic critic of the book called The Origin of Consciousness, which reads this story as the as a story of the origin of consciousness. So my mind went from the love in Zarita to the way Eros works in this poem, which is kicked off by something Duncan hears in a line from Pindar. The light foot hears you and the brightness begins. God step at the margins of thought. Um, the, the poet William Everson said the big difference between Western, West Coast poets and East Coast poets is that West Coast poets dress to their archetype and so they always look ridiculous. <laughs> and East Coast poets dress down. I'm just an ordinary guy so that the, the magic will appear. Duncan wore capes. He, <laughs> he believed in full magic. And he was a brilliant uh, mon monologist. There are famous stories. When he went to uh, visit the poet Louis Zukowski, who he revered a visit from San Francisco to New York, big deal in the 1950s, um, he said he stayed up all night talking into the mirror so that he would shut up when he was with Zukowski and actually hear <laughs> something that he said. And the few times I ever walked with him, it was completely a monologue. And one of the things he said is he didn't believe in revision. And there are poems of his like this that are quite complicated. And I said to him as we were walking along, you've never, well, what about my mother would be a falconist? He said, I never revised it. And we walked along and he was talking about, we was talking about then, um, I, I finally got in a word and I said, well, how long did it take you to write it? And he said, about 18 months. <laughs> so this is what he thought what the process was. And in that same conversation, he said, I'm, Charles Olson can't stand it that there's Christian imagery in my poems, you know, because it's okay to have Mayan things and you can have any exotic, but you can't have. And really, I mean, somebody has to say, really, there are only two inventions of Western culture that mean anything. And I, Wait a minute, what are the two inventions of Western culture? He said, romantic love and civil disobedience. <laughs> so anyway, he was an interesting person. <laughs> and, and, and he operates at the high style. He's not afraid to use a phrase like torso reverberations of a Grecian lyre. He sets the, he's, he sets the tone, tonal register very high, and you kind of have to get, it's like a taste for scotch or something. You kind of have to get used to it. God step at the margins of thought, quick adulterous tread at the heart. Who is it that goes there? Where I see your quick face, notes of an old music pace the air, torso reverberations of a Grecian lyre. In Goya's canvas, Cupid and Psyche have a hurt. You can see this uh, 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 reproduction on, on the internet. Have a hurt, voluptuous grace, bruised by redemption. <laughs> Notice that language, 
grace redemption. The copper light falling upon the brown boy's slight body is carnal fate that sends the soul wailing up from blind innocence ensnared by dimness into the deprivations of desiring sight. It's a kind of complicated, I think of myself reading this at 21, feeling completely baffled by it. That's kind of mild nausea I felt reading the beginning of the four quartets. You think <laughs> there's something amazing going on here and I may never understand it. <laughs> Duncan believes in a certain idea of the fall, uh, that, that we make law by breaking law, that tragedy is the teacher of law, that medieval Medieval legal theory was his academic interest in some. Um, uh, there's a poem of his that begins, the law I love is major mover, from which flows destructions of the Constitution. He's a sense that desire is constantly, um, as it is, constantly violating the surface of things, rattling the surface of things. The copper light falling upon the brown boy's slight body is carnal fate that sends the soul wailing up from blind innocence, ensnared by dimness into the deprivations of desiring light. Lacan's way of saying that in 21st century psychic speak is we all have a big hole in ourselves. <laughs> it's filled with longing for a completion that may not exist. But the eyes in Goya's painting are soft, diffuse with rapture, absorb the flame. Their bodies yield out of strength. Waves of visual pleasure wrap them in a sorrow previous to their impatience, a bronze of yearning, a rose that burns the tips of their bodies, lips, ends of fingers, nipples. You have to look at the Goya to see how beautiful. He is not winged, his thighs are flesh, are clouds lit by the sun and it's going down. Hot luminescence at the lines of the visible. That's, that, that's an example of the, uh, that next step of rhetoric. But they are not in a landscape. They exist in an obscurity. The wind spreading the sail serves them. The two jealous sisters eager for her ruin serve them that she is ignorant, ignorant of what love will be, serves them. The dark serves them. The oil scalding his shoulder serves them, serves their story. Fate spinning knots the threads for love. Jealousy, ignorance, the hurt serve them. The story of the fall takes us just that far. He said when he wrote the beginning of this that he realized it was going to be, that it was like a 19th century symphony, so it was going to be in four parts. This is part two, when he begins to meditate on that story. And I'm interested in the way that it takes us into the social and political space. This is magic. How are we on time? Am I out of time? Three more minutes, five more minutes. This is magic, it is passionate dispersion. What if they grow old? The gods would not allow it. Psyche is preserved. In time, we see a tragedy, a loss of beauty, the glittering youth of the god retains. But from this threshold, it is age that is beautiful. It is toward the old poets we go. Their faltering, their unaltering wrongness that has style, their variable truth, the old faces, words shed like tears from a plenitude of powers, time stars. That phrase echoes across both Kim Hai Sun and Zarita, the tears stored by time. A stroke, these little strokes, a chill, the old man feeble does not recoil. This is, this is the oddest, and if you don't know what's going on, the most obscure part of the poem, and the short version is that in the year this was written, both Dwight Eisenhower and William Carlos Williams had strokes and lost the power of speech for a few days before they recovered it. And that's gonna become 
one of the metaphors for the task of psyche. The first task she's given when love uh, gives her, a, when Venus gives her a job to do, Aphrodite gives her a job to do, is she's given a huge pile of seeds of all kinds to be sorted. Basic farm work, sorting the kinds of seeds. And he's going to turn that in this poem into a metaphor for the poet's work. But here the poet's work can get lost, can get lost in the recall a phrase that only a part of the word injured thundermaker's descent. I've never understood that thundermaker's descent line. Dam merging a nerve, a nerve, the presidented of the United States, states the heavy clod cloud invades the brain. What if li lilacs last in this dooryard bloomed? Think of the great Whitman elegy. That goes in my mind with Whitman's laying the, laying the flowers on the grave of Lincoln rhymes in my mind now with Marilyn Robinson's great wreath for Emmett Till laying the wreath on, on the body of that boy, another tortured boy in our history. Hoover, Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, where among these did the power reside that moves the heart? What flower of the nation, bright sweet, broke to the whole rapture? Hoover, Coolidge, Harding, Wilson. Here the factories of human misery turning out commodities. From whom are the holy matins of the heart singing? Noble men in the quiet of morning hear Indians singing the continent's violent requiem. Harding, Wilson, Taft, Roosevelt. Idiots fumbling at the bride's door. Hear the cries of men in meaningless debt and war. Where among these did the spirit reside that restores the land to productive order? McKinley, Cleveland, Harrison, Arthur, Garfield, Hayes, Grant, Johnson dwell in the roots of the heart's rancor. How sad amid lanes and through old woods echoes Whitman's love for Lincoln. There is no continuity then. Only a few posts of the good remain. I too, that am a nation, sustain the damage where smokes of continual ravage obscure the flame. It is across great scars of wrong. I reach toward the song of kindred men and strike again the naked string well, it's hard to imagine now anybody writing the lines, the song of kindred men and strike again the native string. This is what I mean about the pitch of it. Old Whitman sang glorious mistake that cried, the theme is creative and has vista. He is the president of regulation. I see always the underside turning fumes that injure the tender landscape from which upbreak like blossoms of courage in daily act, striving to meet a natural measure. The next part is about Psyche's task. Um, as you can see, the words spread out. It also brings us to pound in the prison in, in Pisa. But I've come to the end of my time. You're going to have to um, read the rest of this poem yourself. And what I've added at the end thinking to get to and didn't get to as a little present is section 12 of Seamus Heaney's Station Island. It's the moment in the poem when he's on this Irish island in which, to which pilgrims go to say the stations of the cross, meditate on the suffering and crucifixion of Christ. And at the 12th station, James Joyce appears to Seamus Heaney and gives him a craft lecture. <laughs> And I'll leave that for you to read. Thanks very much.